Hey everybody, welcome back to AIT 1203. I'm Mike Deal, your instructor for mechanical installation. All right, today we're going to talk about fasteners. All right, uh, primarily we're going to be talking about bolts, okay, some machine screws, uh, some lock washers, washers, nuts, and things like that, the various components that we can use to assemble two different parts, whether they be two different pieces of metal or, or two casings or something like that. Regardless, we're going to be talking about fasteners and how they work. Now, most of what we're going to talk about today is the bolt, all right? We're going to talk about bolts, we're going to talk about machine screws, uh, we're going to talk about sizes and the thread pitch, which are very critical uh, when identifying hardware, okay? Uh, washers, lock washers, and nuts, okay? Now, there's a lot of specialty hardware out there, and I can't possibly cover it all. We're just going to co cover a small percentage, and it's going to be basically geared around what you will probably see when you get out into industry or what you're possibly seeing right now if you're already working in the industry, okay? But um, for those guys who have been out there in the field for a while, you're probably going to pick up a couple things that you didn't know. And for the guys who have never worked with this before, there's a, lot, there's a little bit of science behind it, so it kind of gets interesting uh, as we go along, okay? But like I said, we're going to focus on the bolt, okay, and first, okay? And basically, a bolt is, uh, is something with, is a, is, is a uh, fastener, with external threads and the nut that accompanies it is the fastener part with the internal threads and those threads mesh as you can see here in this diagram. Okay, so we and most of the nuts turn to the right in order to uh, travel down toward the head of the bolt and left to loosen or take it apart. Okay, now these got these have to mesh and there's but there's more to it than that. What we're trying to do is when you have something bolted together. Okay, you have two pieces of steel and you have a bolt that goes through there. Okay. The idea is that we want to put a tensile strength, uh, a stretching force on that bolt, okay? So that we are actually literally stretching the bolt, okay? That's what the bolt is designed to do, is to be stretched so that it can provide a, a pressing force, a compression force on the material that we're trying to assemble, assemble okay? So as you look at this, these are the identical bolts. Um, this is the one that was in, before it was installed and this is one after it was in, installed. We have um, installed it, we've tightened that nut down to a certain torque value, which we'll get into a little bit later. But as a result, we have uh, stretched that bolt and provided and, and applied a great tensile strength along the axis of this bolt head, of this bolt shank right here, okay? So when we screw that nut down or tighten that nut down, we are literally stretching the bolt. That's the effect we want to have on the bolt. Okay? Now you can overdo it when you tighten the bolt. Most of the time people think you kind of twist it off, but what you've done is you, you have applied too much tensile strength and it breaks the bolt. What we're trying to do is to apply enough uh, torque to this nut so that we apply the proper amount of tensile strength that that bolt is rated for. Okay? And we don't want to under apply because we don't get the stretching and we don't get the compression force that we're looking for too against the two pieces of material that we are assembling. So, let's take a look at this diagram again. We are producing a tensile strength along the bolt shank when we tighten something up, okay? And that tensile strength provides us with clamping pressure. So these are our two pieces of material that we're trying to bolt together, okay? And we apply that tensile strength, that stretching of that bolt, okay? And then it's gonna apply a clamping pressure. Now here's the thing, we're trying to apply enough clamping pressure through our tensile strength, uh, our tensile pressure, okay, or force, we're trying to apply enough of that clamping pressure so that forces such as this, going this way and this way, uh, are not going to uh, allow this piece of material to move. In other words, we want this to be, the, or the clamping pressure, to be the stronger force so that other forces cannot come in here and upset it or move it or try to break it loose and, you know, free it up. So we have both the tensile strength, and these are a couple things you might want to remember, okay, tensile strength, and the clamping pressure, okay? When we, again, we want these to be greater than our outside forces that, are, that our material is going to be exposed to, okay? There's the proper method of putting the bolts in here. I know this is a little bit blurry here, but what we want is we want the shank of the bolt, the unthreaded portion of that, to be where the meat of the material being bolted together uh, is. We don't necessarily, we don't, this is not a good idea to have threads trying to take the shear forces. Now, these are the shear forces moving this way and this way on these two pieces of material, okay? Um, again, we're, we're holding that thing, we're clamping it, we get the better clamping pressure when we have the, full, the unthreaded shank of the bolt through the hole of the material and not 
relying on the threaded part to, uh, to hold it into place, okay? We want that solid body of that bolt in there so that it can resist and because the threads cannot stand up to the shear pressure that the main shank of the bolt can. Okay, so that's just, I just threw this slide in here because a lot of people just throw a bolt in here. As long as it sticks out the other end, we're good to go. That's not the case, okay? So we want a proper size length of our bolt and to go through the material and then, and of course we'll put the, uh, the uh, nuts and washers on there accordingly too. But this is very critical, okay? All right, now when we, we're talking about applying these tensile strengths, okay? And we, we apply torque to the nut that gives us that tensile strength, okay? Well, there's a chart out here for standard there's just, uh, torque charts available, and I'm going to have a couple of these in the lab so that you can reference them when we go to uh, some torquing procedures that we're going to be going through in the lab. You'll be able to reference them. And I know you can't see this very clearly, but for example, I've got a half inch uh, bolt with, uh, with this size there, and we want to be able to apply a certain amount of torque to that to get that uh, optimum tensile strength, that optimal stretch. Okay, and we're looking at, uh, looks like um, 15 foot-pounds right there, okay? So we'll apply foot, 15 foot-pounds, and again, we're going to use our torque wrench to know how, exactly how much 15 pounds is. Once we hear the breakaway torque wrench uh, snap for us, uh, we know that we've applied the proper amount of torque value to that nut, okay? One other thing I want to talk to you about, too, is when we assemble something, um, and we put our torque, we put our wrench here on the uh, nut and, and one on the bolt too. We apply the turn, turning pressure, uh, turning force or torquing to the nut itself. And we'll hold the bolt head with a wrench to hold it still. But we want to twist the nut. We don't want to twist the bolt unless it's in a blind hole. Now this is a through hole because it goes all the way through the material. Now if the inside of this material right here were threaded, uh, to, on, on this piece right here, and there were no nut or anything like that on the other side, then we would have no choice but to torque the bolt, okay? But when you've got a through assembly, a through bolt assembly like this, we want to hold this still and not apply that twisting torsion uh, force to the bolt. We want to do all the twisting and the tightening and torquing on the nut, okay? A little side nut for you as you start to put things together, okay? But. Um, we'll have, I'll we'll have the chart out here and you'll see we've got grade 5, grade 8 hardware. I'm going to cover that here shortly, okay? But um, again, the torque value is critical uh, that we get that tensile strength, okay? And not all bolts are created equal, alright? Not all of them have the proper, can handle the tensile strength of, of, of another type of bolt, okay? They are basically um, categorized in grades, okay? Like here on this one, the first one I've got is a grade two bolt, all right? Grade two bolt, I've got one up here. I'm gonna show you, I'm try to get here close to the lens. This is a grade two bolt, and I know this because when I look at the head, there are no markings on it whatsoever, all right? I think I can get a little bit closer there. You'll see there's no markings on this bolt head, all right? This is a, stand, this is a grade two, it's a very standard, general hardware bolt. You'll see these at True Value. Um, Lowe's has a lot of them, okay? But if you just go get a general bolt, it's probably going to be a grade two and you can identify it with no markings on the head whatsoever. Uh, these are great for around the home, the shop, and things like that for things, but in terms of uh, industry, um, you know, in an industrial environment where there's a lot of forces uh, and, and, and uh, harsh environments and things like that. It's got to be kind of robust. So a grade two is not going to be your uh, go-to bolt, uh, particularly when you're working on machines and equipment that are subjected to a lot of vibration and a lot of different uh, forces going on within the machine. Um, with the exception of the manufacturing marks, you know, grade two bolts, they don't have any at all. They might have a little manufacturing mark of some sort on here, but it won't have any markings, so to speak. Uh, and again, this is your general everyday almost almost household type hardware okay something you're not going to use but you will see grade five now also one other thing these are, these are the most uh, least expensive type bolt i'm going to tell you why in just a minute the grade five is the next step up grade five bolts are hardened more so than the grade two all right uh, i've got a uh, grade five bolt here for you and we can identify it with the three uh, hash marks right there on this bolt. Okay, you can kind of see them up on the screen as well. Got three hash marks. Um, There's a little diamond right here, a little manufacturer mark. But 
Uh, the gray cloud bowl uh, is more common in industry, and mostly in automotive as well. Uh, it's hardened a little bit more uh, than the gray two. The gray two is not hardened at all. Uh, hardening is basically a heat treating process where the uh, bolt is uh, heated to a certain temperature. Uh, the material that the bolt's made from is heated to a certain temperature and quenched uh, at a certain rate, cooled down at a certain rate, and it gives a certain hardness and, and, and a little bit more, uh, it's a more robust bolt uh, than just the grade two, okay? And again, you can identify one of these uh, with the three marks on it like that, okay? Now the grade A is the next size, uh, or the next grade we're gonna talk about. Okay, uh, I got a grade eight right here, and I can identify this bolt, a grade eight, with six marks on it, not eight, but six marks right there on the head, okay? I think, I'm hoping you can see that. But um, the grade eight bolt's been hardened more than the five has. So it's gonna be more expensive than the five, okay? Because it has to go through a more extensive heat treating process, so it's gonna raise the cost for that process to be done. Um, they're stronger, used in automotive suspensions, Okay, and uh, again, they're identified with the, uh, with the uh, six marks on the head, all right? The last type of bolt that I want to talk to you about is the alloy steel. It has a different look about it all together. It's sort of a black matte finish to it, and also it's not very smooth or slick like some of the other zinc uh, coated ones or galvanized bolts like that. Uh, they are, um, it's, it's a black matte, a little bit of a rougher finish, okay? These have a very high tensile strength. Okay, they can put, you can put a lot of tensile force on there and get a lot of press of uh, compression uh, on our on the materials that are being joined together. Okay, um, these like I said, these go through a further heat heat treatment process. They're probably the most expensive bolt of the ones that we're going to talk about at least. And um, they are that that heat treatment is what causes that black finish. Okay, now these are very strong tensile strength wise. Um, not so much as much as shear, the, the shear force is not as great, okay? But uh, they really put a lot of clamping pressure on the two materials that we're trying to join. So that's uh, just some basic identifiers for, for bolts in, in general, okay? And we're gonna go a little bit deeper in how we identify bolts too, okay? Now, one of the other ways we, <clears throat> that we identify is by the diameter of the bolt. Okay, right there, and for example, I've got this a three-quarter 10. All right, I'll get to the 10 in a second, but this three-quarter tells us that the shank of the bolt is, if I were to put a tape measure across there or, or a six-inch rule, I would measure three-quarters of an inch in diameter, okay? So that tells us how, 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 how the diameter of that bolt shank, okay? The dash 10 tells us the number of um, threads per inch, okay? And we measure these, you see these peaks right here in the threads, okay? All right, from peak to peak to peak is one pitch. So uh, this tells us how many uh, peaks are in one inch, okay? That's the standard that we use within an inch, okay? So in this case, I got a three quarter 10, all right? So I've got 10 threads. If I were to count these as threads, I would count these. There'd be 10 of them in a one inch span. So that's how we identify uh, another way that we identify the bolt is three quarter inch in uh, diameter and it's going to have 10 threads per inch. Now, you could have the uh, same diameter bolt with more threads per inch. For example, we'll go to my chart that I showed just a minute ago. Bear with me. Okay. Uh, and the three quarter 10 um, is, it can also have three quarter uh, 24, which is a fine thread. I, you can, it's so difficult to see, I, I know. But, uh, so it can have more than 10 threads per inch. This would be a coarse thread, and, a, and you'd have more, it would be a fine thread. We're gonna talk about coarse and fine threads too. But for right now, we're, we're just talking about the diameter and the thread pitch, okay? And there's one more element too that we have to look at, and that is the length of the bolt itself, okay? Now this, is, the length is determined from the end of the bolt up to the bottom of the head. It is not included, in, the head is not included in the length, okay? So in other words, this length right here for this bolt would go uh, from right here just to the underside of the head, and the head is not included in the length size. 
So when I look at this uh, descriptor up here for my, for my bolt, I've got three quarter inch diameter, 10 threads per inch by two inches long, okay? Now there is one exception uh, to that, and that is when we're dealing with countersunk bolts, all right? You'll have a countersunk, uh, and we've talked about Allen head uh, screws, okay? And these will usually have an Allen head right in there. But on a countersunk screw, the head is included in the overall length of the bolt, or the identifying length of the bolt. Okay, with a, with a machine screw or the bolt, as we've been talking about, we do not include the length of that, okay? So, uh, when we're talking about length, we're talking about up to the head, if it's got a, if it's got a raised head, if it's a flush head or a countersunk head, then it, yes, it does include the, uh, the head as well, okay? Now, I said something a minute ago, um, about a fine thread versus a coarse thread, okay? And I've got a couple of examples here of these. Okay? All right. For example, here you go. All right. So we got the same diameter bolt, okay? And we have the same length of bolt right here. But you'll notice that the threads, the thread pitch is different. This one is going to have more threads or peaks that we showed you up there on the screen earlier per inch than this one, okay? So this would, this would uh, if this were a three quarter, this would be your three quarter 10, and this would be your three quarter 24, because it's gonna have a lot more threads per inch, okay? So you can physically see, you can visually see the, the difference between these, and I've got them up here on the screen as well, more threads per inch than the uh, coarse version of it, okay? So we would have a 3 8 inch diameter, and this would give us the number of uh, uh, threads per inch, 16, or the fine one would be 24. Now, there is a difference in, in, in these two. Uh, the, the coarse thread, you're going to find these a lot more readily uh, than, than the fine thread. But the fine thread does have its, uh, it does have its uses and its, and its place. The fine pitch requires less torque, okay? Uh, than the coarse pitch does. All right, so it will it will go down on there uh, on the on the fast the, on the fastener itself. Uh, it doesn't require the, a higher torque value, as high a torque value, I should say. On that chart that I showed you there, I'm not going to go back to it right now. You'll see it in the lab, but the chart will show you that for a 3 8 bolt bolt um, 16 uh, threads per inch versus the 24, you do not have to apply the same amount of torque to that nut to get the same amount of tensile uh, stretch on that bolt, or that's tensile force on that bolt. So uh, it, it, um, the fine threads are less likely to loosen, that's because there are more threads engaged in the nut and the bolt assembly itself within that given space. So you've got more engagement, so there's more of, of, a, of the uh, locking uh, force to it. So they're less likely to come loose. Um, they are easier to, to uh, tap into a, uh, the, into a piece of metal. We're going to get into drilling and tapping in the lab. Uh, a fine thread is, is much easier than a coarse thread to, to tap when you're tapping a hole. So, uh, but they, uh, they're also more susceptible to being cross-threaded. And by cross-threaded, we're talking about um, getting it in sideways a little bit and there's fine threads and they'll walk in there sideways before you realize that you've damaged the threads on either the nut um, or the bolt itself. Um, so you've got to be very careful when you're dealing with fine thread. The coarse thread, as I said earlier, they are more readily available. Um, they're uh, a little higher resistance to, to uh, stripping. And the reason being is because you see how fine uh, these threads are right here. Uh, they're just a little bit more susceptible thread. That's why you don't put the same torque on the, a fine thread that you would uh, a coarse thread, okay? Um, so they're a little bit uh, more susceptible to stretching. Uh, the uh, coarse thread is, um, is a faster assembly. You don't have as many turns to, if you're traveling one inch down that bolt, you're on a, on a 24 uh, inch per thread, uh, threads per inch, excuse me, it's gonna take more rotations of that nut to travel the same uh, distance as it would a coarse. So it's a little bit faster assembly. Um, it's less likely to gall, to, to, to two of them to gall together. Um, it's a little bit more forgiving if the threads become damaged on a, uh, like if, they, if it gets cross-threaded on a coarse thread as opposed to a fine thread, uh, it's a little bit more forgiving and probably clean itself up a lot better uh, as opposed to a fine thread. 
And like I said earlier, it's a lot easier uh, to, when you go into, like if you go into a typical hardware store, uh, you're going to find, uh, uh, you will have fine thread bolts, but you're going to find a lot more variety of the coarse thread and just use more, uh, you know, just more uh, often than, than, than the fine thread, okay? So we talked about the bolts, and now we're going to talk about machine screws a little bit. They also are a fastener, but they're not uh, usually used in uh, the more robust applications. But they do have its place, particularly in electrical panel building. When we mount relays and variable frequency drives and motor starters uh, and terminal strips and things like that in, in, a, in an electrical panel, we're, gonna, we're not going to use big half-inch bolts. We're going to use smaller machine screws, and they have its, their place as well. Okay? Uh, machine, this is a, a couple of pictures of a machine screw. You got your uh, slotted uh, flat blade, or you got your Phillips. Uh, it's just a couple of different examples. Again, I can't possibly cover all of the machine types, uh, types of machine screws, but we'll cover the standard ones. Typically, um, the machine screw is threaded all the way up to the head, as opposed to that bolt. Uh, the one here I've got one to show you here. You remember the, the bolt uh, kind of goes to the threads and. and to a certain extent, and then you've got this part of the shank that's unthreaded that will be there with the meat of the material being bolted together. But uh, a machine screw will um, have the threads all the way up the shank up to the head, okay? And as I stated on the last slide, it has some type of internal recess to drive uh, for it to be tightened and loose, okay? And this is a Phillips one. This is in terms of the head, Phillips, and of course you have the flathead. We talked a little bit about the star, the, the torque bit, things like that. Um, so they're, they're recessed in there. Uh, they are typically installed in applications that have a blind hole. In other words, you'll build uh, the bottom piece of, like if I have two pieces of metal and I'm trying to, uh, to uh, assemble, uh, a blind hole will have internal threads on the bottom one, and the top piece will have a through hole so that the screw goes through the top piece and then it starts to thread the, uh, the bottom piece. Obviously, you don't want threads on both of them because they won't come together like they're supposed to. But uh, a blind hole is when the material has the internal threads to it itself. Uh, and typically, uh, while you can assemble things like with a machine screw and nuts, typically they are just run through a blind hole and tighten up through the blind hole, and a nut is not required. But you will run across some uh, cases where there will be nuts on the back of the machine screws as well. Um, and you use this typically, uh, this is how we, uh, this is sort of the anatomy of, of a machine screw, okay? Let's take a look at it. First of all, we talked about the length, okay? Remember, on a, on a, on a raised head uh, fastener, the length is only from the bottom of the head to the end of the, of the shank itself, okay? And the countersunk, you'll notice here where in the countersunk, the length includes the head. It stretches over here and it includes the head as well. It too is threaded up to the bottom of the head, but the head is included in the uh, countersunk. Okay? You have your head diameter right here across here and the head diameter on the countersunk as well. Those are the same. You have the shank diameter or the nominal diameter as often. This may be a quarter inch at me. And they, there's different numbering systems for bolts as they are. Uh, than there are for machine screws. And again, we talked about length. One thing on the countersunk uh, fastener, uh, typically the, the most common uh, degree of countersunk, uh, countersinking is about 82 degrees. Okay? There are some 100 degree fasteners, but overall the, the, the most popular one is, is 82 degree angle, and it's listed right there as your angle there for X. Okay? But that's sort of the anatomy of a uh, machine screw. Okay, and machine screws come in different sizes, and you can kind of see this chart a little bit. Um, you know, you got your quarter inch happens to be a number 14 size uh, screw, they call it number 14. That is a quarter inch uh, equivalent, um, and the decimal is a uh, 0 0.250 for a quarter inch. Okay, um, and you could go up number six, number eight. When you start getting below number six, I mean, you're looking at really small screws, really fine threads. Uh, kind of difficult to work with. Uh, typically 8, 10, uh, 12, and 14 are, uh, are your typical sizes that we'll work with. Uh, I don't see a lot of 13s, 11s, and things like that, but they are out there for special applications or specific applications. But you go to the hardware store, you're going to look at something like 6, 8, and 10, and 12, and 14, things like that. But that's how machine screws are sized by number, okay? All right, and of course, this is another uh, kind of a breakdown. 
And we have a number 1032 UNF 2A three quarter inch slot pan head machine screw made of steel and zinc coated. All right, what is all that that I just rattled off? Well, a 1032, we already talked about t number 10 uh, is your size right there. So a 10 will tell me that I've got a 3 16 inch uh, nominal diameter of my thread body, of the, of the, of the fastener body, okay? All right, we said 32 is the number of threads per inch. That's the number of teeth that you'll find within a one inch span along the length of that uh, bolt, okay? Or, or excuse me, machine screw. Um, the UNF, this is UNF versus UNC. Uh, United National Fine Thread, United National Coarse Thread. Again, the uh, coarse thread uh, is not going to have as many uh, inch, uh, uh, teeth per inch uh, on, on the uh, or, or, uh, th threads per inch. Excuse me, I'll get it out. Um, and then the two A's a thread class. Three quarter would be the number, the length in sixteenths of an inch. Okay, so. Uh, this would be actually 12 sixteenths would be a three quarter, but it's in the sixteenths, and they reduce it down to three quarter. Uh, the slotted tells us the type of drive. And the, you know, this is a flat head screw. All right, pan head is the type. This, this is the head style. It's a machine screw made of steel, and it's got a zinc plating that covers it. Okay, so it gives us the type of finish uh, that that the screw has. So that's kind of a breakdown in the anatomy of a machine screw. Okay. So we've talked about bolts and, and uh, machine screws. Now we want to talk a little bit about washers. Washers are critical. Uh, you typically don't want to put something together without some form of washer, okay? Now there are some occasions where you, where you won't use a washer, but uh, general assembly type uh, functions, yeah, you're going to use a washer. You're going to use a couple different kinds. One of them's a flat washer and one of them's a lock washer, all right? Now the flat washer is designed to distribute that compressing force, okay, that we talked about in the first couple of slides, you know, we're, we have that tensile force that applies the compressing force against our two materials. What it does is it gives it a little bit more surface area than the bolt head or the nut by itself, okay? So it, it allows us to uh, expand that pressure cone uh, out just a little bit further and apply that, compress that, um, uh, that uh, compression force, okay? Uh, and it's based on, I've got a flat washer right here, and it's based most of the time on the inside diameter of the washer, okay? Now, sometimes you get specialty washers that are a lot bigger with the same size diameter hole. Uh, and they're sometimes known as fender washers. But overall, we use the in, uh, inside diameter of the hole uh, to identify the washer. So if I've got a half inch, um, if I've got a half inch bolt, then, the, then I'm sizing my washer with a half inch uh, for the half inch bolt. So I we use a half inch washer, okay? So again, uh, it, it, it expands the, the uh, pressure that's applied to our pieces that we're trying to join, all right? Uh, now, one thing I wanna caution you about, and I, I've seen this a lot, a lot of times you will have, uh, you'll find the material here, the hole is bigger than the shank of the uh, bolt. Now it's naturally going to be slightly bigger so that it can slide in, okay? Um, you don't want a, a real tight a differential fit there. So it's slightly uh, bigger, but what you don't want is a, a where it allows that bolt to, to wallow around or move around within the hole. It should stay fairly stable uh, and stationary inside the material. What I've seen a lot of people do um, and it's a quick fix, is they will use a larger washer under the head, okay, so that the bolt head won't fall through the hole. The washer is not designed for that. It's designed to be backed up by the material right here, okay? If we didn't have the material right here, that, that washer would cave. It's not hardened steel. It, it's hardened to a degree, but it's not designed to take the place of this metal right here. All right, it's just designed to apply the forces to it. So if you try to, to tighten it down with too big of a hole, it's going to cup it in there. You've lost the whole purpose of the washer. So make sure that if, and if your bolt is not big enough uh, for that hole, if it's wallowed out, for example, bore it out to the next size up and go to the next size bolt. Okay, get a good, nice, tight fit, and then that washer can do its job on both the head side and the nut side. Okay. So I've seen that done. Uh, you probably have too. Not a good practice, so don't recommend it, so don't do that, okay? Now, the next type of washer we're gonna talk about is the lock washer, 
All right. Some people call this a spring washer, uh, a spring lock washer, a split washer. Okay. Basically, what it is is a piece of steel, spring steel, um, that's been treated to hold its uh, spring uh, force. And you can see the split right there. You can kind of see how it gets its name for both the, the split or the spring. And what happens is we tighten the nut down and it presses these two together, uh, that flattens it out. And there's always a spring pressure being applied up against the nut. Now, it's a misconception that the spring washer is applying a back pressure against that nut that, that holds it in place. That is not how a lock washer, a split lock washer, is designed to work. What it's designed to do is it's designed to dig into that flat washer and the nut, okay? As we tighten it up, uh, we tighten it up and flattens it out, okay? And if this nut tries to back out, then it, the, the, the uh, lip right there on the spring uh, washer, the lock washer, digs into the nut. This one digs into the washer and it sort of traps it, keeps it from, from turning. It's fairly effective, uh, you know, not the, not the best way of, of it could be pretty secure. There are, there are better ways of doing it, but for general purposes, yeah, split lock, or split lock washer is going to be okay. Um, the other type of lock washer was the internal and the external lock washer. I've got pictures of both of these. Here's the spring or split lock that we talked about. This is the external. It's got these uh, little sharp jaded uh, uh, tangs on the outside and likewise, this is the internal when they are, where they are internal, okay? They do the same thing, same concept. They bite into the metal on one, one piece of the, of the uh, fastener and then they bite it up for the washer, excuse me, and they bite into the metal of the nut and they try to keep it uh, a mechanical lock in place. And they're, they're fairly effective, you know, um, but again, there are some better ways to, uh, to make sure that, that these fasteners stay secure. And again, the biggest one is applying that proper tensile. I'm going to go over that again and again. It's the proper tensile force to that bolt so that it stretches. And that's your clamping pressure. And that's also pressure up against your nut. But you really need flat washers and lock washers to go with your assembly as well. Okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit about nuts because this is kind of important. Um, there's a couple different ones that really keep the pressure applied to our whatever it is we're assembling. Okay? First one I want to talk to you about is the plain nut. Okay? We're going to talk about the the pal nut uh, or jam nut as it's often referred to, uh, the lock nut and the castle nut, okay? So the plain nut um, is, I've got one right here, okay? Pretty straightforward. Um, okay, just a plain nut like that, okay? Threaded, and again, the plain nut has to match, the, the threads uh, have to match the same pitch as the bolt. That's how it's identified, okay? Now, I, we talked a little bit about this in the hardware uh, lesson. The nut is sized not across from, uh, from flat to, to opposing flat. That's the wrench size that you'll use. The nut is sized based on the bolt diameter that it's going to fit on and the number of threads uh, per inch inside the nut, okay, because they've got to match. Uh, a three quarters 10 will not work, or excuse me, three quarters 16 will not work with a three quarter 24. All right, so uh, they all have to match up. All right, so uh, again, the, uh, the nut applies that tensile force to the bolt, it gives that proper stretch. All right, but it does need a method of staying secure, it can't do it on its own. Okay, um, sometimes we'll use a second or jam nut, it's often referred, referred to as a pal nut. Uh, to help prevent the main nut from loosening, okay? All right, and this is, this is uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about this. Um, this is a picture or an illustration of a plain nut with a jam nut. Now, this is a common thing here uh, used for high vibration, um, high vibration applications, all right? The low profile, the jam nuts are rather low profile. It's about half the uh, width or thickness of the regular nut. This would be your regular nut. This is the jam nut or the pal nut. It's about half the height of the regular nut, okay? And the jam nut goes against the material that we're trying to clamp together, okay? Not the other way around, all right? It's a misconception that you put the more robust nut against the material and then you go in here and you put this little jam nut on here to help keep him in place. 
it's the, actually the exact opposite. What we want to do is we want to tighten this pound or jam nut down and bring the threads up and tighten it up and then put the knot on there, the uh, standard nut on top of it. And these two, they're right where the threads come out of this one and they go in here, they really mesh very, very tightly, okay? Uh, I've got a video um, in this uh, lesson that I want you to watch. It shows a demonstration of how quickly uh, a, a, an assembly will come disassembled when you put the uh, big nut against the material and then you try to lock it down with a little pal nut on top. Uh, it's amazing how quickly that will come uh, apart when it's subjected to the vibration uh, in that demonstration. But look for those videos uh, in, in this lesson. So it's pretty, pretty neat. Uh, but you got to make sure that you put it together properly. Okay. Now, there are some specialty type nuts that uh, we are going to talk about uh, that help uh, with uh, keeping uh, things assembled uh, when they're subjected to a lot of vibration, okay? The first one is the fiber lock nut, okay? I've got one of these here in my hand. And the right bolt here, okay? And what it is, and I'm going to try to get it up here as close as I can. I'll try to hold it at a little bit of an angle. You can see the fiber uh, insert that's in there, okay? Now, unlike the regular nut that will go all the way, uh, you know, I can run it all the way down up to the, to the end of the threads, the fiber gets in the way and interferes and sort of creates interference with these threads, all right? And, the, and if I were to tighten this down with wrenches, I would not be able to disassemble them very easily with my hands, all right? It's gonna require a wrench to be able to get this on here and to run it down. But the idea is that the insert will lock up against these threads and provide a pressure, uh, a clamping pressure and a resistance for it from trying to come apart. There's a resistance for it, a resistance for it uh, trying to be assembled or go on, and there's also a resistance for it to try to back off. Uh, this is a really good, uh, very effective nut to be using when there's a lot of vibration. Now, you gotta be careful though, because that fiber, unlike steel, that fiber is uh, a little uh, sensitive to heat. Okay, so you can't use it in a high application like for around furnaces and things like that. Um, they, they are for just your general temperatures, but you got a fiber insert right here that, that really um, that, that really provides some good um, anti-loosening uh, properties, if you will. Okay, now because you saw me put, trying to put this together, uh, if I have a let's say I have a, um, a, a torque requirement of I'm going to use 100 foot pounds, just making this up. So I've got 100 foot pounds. Okay, well. The nut itself may, may uh, require an additional five, six, seven uh, foot pounds just to, just to turn it on the bolt, much less get that stretch. So let's suppose we have a 100, we have a, a 100 foot pound requirement for our, to get that proper tensile strength um, or tensile force on the bolt. Okay, we're going to need to add uh, some additional torque to offset what this is going against too. Okay. So, the, or the resistance this is going to go. So, uh, I, there's some, there's several articles, there's several charts uh, out there on the internet. So, we may have to add an additional six pounds. So, if I'm required to have 100 pounds to get that proper uh, tensile strength or tensile force, uh, then we're going to probably have to add an additional six or seven pounds because if not, then we're giving away part of our torque just to get the nut to turn. Okay, you'll see all of this in the lab when you, when we uh, play with the different fasteners. But uh, you know you're gonna have to add that so that you still so that fastener still gets its full tensile strength. All right, but that's a fiber lock nut. Um, the steel lock nut. I don't have one of these uh, here in the shop, but they are basically uh, an interference fit by by the close. They close the right here. They kind of close it off a little bit. So there's that still that interference. It does the same thing as the fiber lock nut. The biggest difference though is that these are not affected by temperature. Okay where the fiber could possibly melt or uh, crumble if it, got, if it got too hot over time. Uh, we don't have to worry about that, okay, with these, uh, these steel lock nuts, okay? They're a little harder to get on, a little harder to get off, okay, and sometimes they'll, they'll want to seize up in the threads a little bit, but they are suited for much uh, higher temperature than the fiber lock nut. And like the fiber lock nut, we have to take into account the additional torque that's got to be provided so that at the, at the end of the day, we still have that proper tensile uh, force applied to the bolt and we're stretching it like we want it to, okay? All right, and the last type we're going to talk about is the cast loader nut. Now, I used a lot of these in aviation. 
there, the airplanes, uh, particularly reciprocating engine, uh, your gasoline engines, um, with piston powered, um, subject to a lot of vibration, okay? And so we would use a, a castle nuts because these provide good, solid, mechanical um, uh, locking on the, on the nuts to make sure that they didn't come off, okay? Um, with you know, around the engine compartment, for example, uh, fiber lock nuts uh, weren't used as much because um, because of the heat and everything. Uh, steel locking nuts were used, uh, but on, on these right here, uh, we use these a lot in the engine compartments and anything that's subject to, to shock and a lot of vibration. Uh, most of you probably at some point uh, have worked on automotive, uh, uh, automobiles that have the uh, wheel bearings that require a, a cotter pin and a castle nut. Uh, to assemble it. Um, you have to preload the bearing to a certain amount and then you start looking for the hole in the axle uh, and then you apply, put the nut and line up the castles and, and bend it, bend it uh, the, the uh, cotter pin so that it doesn't come loose. Okay? Certainly you don't want a wheel rolling down the road, uh, coming off down the road. And that's you know high vibration, the vibration of, of a wheel that's out of balance or something that will eventually try to loosen that nut. Well when you've got Castle nut right here, uh, and I've got another picture to show. Here we go. It's proper installation. It's, it's a good positive lock. There's no way that this nut can turn. Uh, and usually, uh, it's a low torque application um, because you know there's not going to be a lot of torque trying to turn this and make it come off. So the cotter pin, even though it's soft metal, does a nice job at holding that on there. It does what it's supposed to do. Okay. So that was our hardware for right now. Again, we're going to be working with this in the, in the lab. Um, again, it's a little bit more than just putting a little pressure on the nut and you know holding it down there like that. What we're trying to do is uh, you know apply the proper forces to not only the uh, the parts that we're mating up, but also the hardware that's holding it. So it's designed to work the proper way. So we've got to make sure that we assemble things the proper way, and that means using the right hardware, the right length, uh, the right locking mechanisms, the, lock, the proper torques. You know, particularly when you work in, uh, if you go to, any, you work on your own cars, you go to your shop manual and there'll be a list of torque values in each section for whatever it is you're doing, whether you're using, working on suspension, brakes, uh, engines, whatever the case may be, there's always a torque chart. If it's a good manual, there's a torque chart. And they want you to torque those things to a certain value so they don't come apart and it, so they don't, you know, give you problems down the road. So again, there is a reason, there's a method behind the madness. But for right now, we just want to talk about the basic stuff. Um, and again, there are so many specialty um, uh, fasteners, I couldn't possibly cover them all. But I just want to give you a basic, uh, you know, overview of, of the ones that we'll be using in the lab, certainly the ones that you'll be using out in the industry. And again, you know, you'll run into the special fasteners along the way and the more you work out there. But for right now, I just want to cover the basics. This has been Fasteners. Um, if you have any questions, find me in the lab and we spend some time, uh, quite a bit of time out there in the lab this semester. So look me up, find me. Uh, we'll answer any questions you've got. But other than that, that's it for Fasteners. Thanks for watching and uh, be sure to watch the next lecture. Thanks.